beginning and no end. You're my hope and my defense. You came to see and save the lost. You paid it all upon the cross. You are stronger. You are stronger. Sin is broken, you have saved me, it is written, Christ is risen, Jesus you are Lord of all. Good morning Clear Creek. Glad you're here this morning, and uh, there's a special group of people that are here with us usually every week. We don't say a lot about it. We have people that are with us this morning that probably have never been to church before. Some who are coming back to church after a long absence. And I want to let you know, I am so glad you're here. And if you're intimidated by what's going on around you, you look at all these people, think they got it all together, don't let their pretty faces fool you. They're, we're just a bunch of goobers going through life together. That's what we do. So if, if you're here for the first time, man, we're glad you're here. We hope that you'll come back. There's always something good going on here. And, and, and I, I think that I am Clear Creek's head cheerleader because I love cheerleading about what God is doing here and, and, and what's going on. And this week I've got some really special things to tell you. Uh, we have three new families that want to be a part of the church family here at Clear Creek. So I'd like to introduce them to you. The first is uh, Matt and Jenny Tipton. I know they're here somewhere. If you would, stand up. Now, now I got to tell you something about Matt and Jenny, and it's going to embarrass them a little bit, but they can shoot me later. They're the only people who have ever come through Pass and Go that were a member of two small groups. That's never happened before. So they've basically been in one small group, and they're moving in another small group. That's an awesome couple, and you've got to get to know them. Matt and Jenny, welcome home. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, the next one is uh, a dear friend, uh, Sherry Ellis. Sherry, are you here somewhere? Uh, If you don't know Sherry, you get to know her. She's a great American. I love you, Sherry. Thank you for being a part of this congregation. Welcome home to you as well. Last, and certainly not least, is Clint and Teresa Etherton. Uh, and I know they're here because I've seen them. So if you would stand up. Where are you at? There we are. There we are. Uh, this is a couple of drives a long way to get here. They evidently think there's something special going on here too. And uh, hope you'll take a, a moment to get to know them and want to welcome you home. We're so glad that you've decided to be a part of this church family. All three of you, uh, groups and families, couples, whatever you I cannot wait to see what God's going to do with you. Because I know that God sends people this way and, and I keep seeing it happen. He continues to send people in our midst that bring something with them that's amazing. And, and so with these, uh, this, all five of you, I can't wait to see what God's going to do in you and through you, and, and I'm just excited that you're part of the family. Before we begin our lesson this morning, let's bow together in a word of prayer. Father, you're an awesome God, and we lift up your name this morning in thanks that you continue to work in our midst in some pretty amazing ways. We also come before you recognizing that we don't deserve any of it, and that whatever you do with us is grace and grace alone. And, and Father, what we come for this morning is, as I preach this morning, we want a clear understanding of who we are and what we're supposed to be. Um, I guess my prayer is for me, don't let me mess this up. This is your church. This is your message. And I pray that you'll speak through me and that hearts will be touched. And Father, we come before you grateful because this is all about Jesus. It's about what he's done for us, the sacrifice he's made on our behalf. And Father, we come before you this morning grateful for grace and for hope and for mercy. We're grateful that we have a group of people that we can assemble with and truly connect with that all have the same mission. May we continue to be a group that turns our community upside down in the name of Jesus and that people will be brought into a life-changing relationship with your son because of what you're doing through the people here. And it's in your son's name we offer this prayer. Amen. 
Last week, if you were here, you realized that I, at the end of the service, I had an illustration I used. And then if you're here for the first time, you haven't seen this, you're probably wondering what these five boxes are up here. Uh, back while uh, the presidential election returns were coming in, uh, Britt Hume, who is a reporter for ABC News, came out. Uh, actually, he was on the air making a, a commentary about the election. And one of the things he said was this that uh, a recent survey had come out and that they had found that only 20% of Americans claimed to have a church affiliation. Actually, that was a reduction in the number. Five years before, the number was 25%, and it's been reduced to 20%. And, and when I heard that, I, I started researching, and I went to a lot of different areas that had had recent studies about church affiliation, who were part of churches, and and uh, they all bounced right around that 20% mark. And so when I started thinking about that, I started thinking about, okay, well, what does that mean? And so I want you to see this. If this represents our community, all these boxes together represent our community. This red box represents people who claim to be part of a church affiliation. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Um, but just to let you know, kind of in, in other terms... Inside this church affiliation, this cup represents our branch of God's family tree. People who call themselves Church of Christ, they go by the name, they, that's, that's us, that's the broad church group. Okay? Now, and I promised you, which you may have got an email that over-promised it, it's going to revolutionize your idea. Nah, I can't revolutionize anybody's idea about anything. But I did want to think... What is church? I mean, is that not the question that we need to be asking? What is church? Now, before we get there, I want you to realize that there's two other sets of boxes here. All of these are people who do not claim a church affiliation. This box with the yellow stripe on it are the people who are considered to be de-churched. Now, what that means is that uh, at one point, they were in the red box. But for some reason, a lot of different reasons, maybe they were injured by church people, maybe they started to see this group of people as being irrelevant to real life. Whatever it is, they decided that they no longer wanted to be in this box, so they have come over to this area. The rest of these people, this 60%, are people who are unchurched. And what that means, quite simply, is in the measurements that I'm seeing, people who have been to church uh, or been to a worship service probably less than five times in their lifetime. They're, they're, it's never been a part of their life. It's never been a part of their lifestyle. It's not who they are. Now, we're going to go through three lessons called Built Strong. And we're going to talk about all these boxes. We're going to look at all these boxes and, and try to make some sense of this whole mess that has happened because we have been sent here to fill out the Great Commission. We're told, as Bobby read earlier, we're to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. And we believe that the church is God's arm in the community. But, you know, I grew up in church. I didn't grow up in this branch of God's family tree, but I grew up in church. Now, that doesn't mean that I bathed in the baptistry and slept in the pews, although I have slept in lots of pews. Some of you will sleep in pews today. But I've always wondered two things. Because I've seen what the church was, how things worked, the way things happened. And I've always wondered two things. We're going to answer these in the next two lessons. One is, what's church really supposed to be? Second question is, who is church for? Next week, we're going to talk about who church is for. Uh, we're going to talk about Built Strong, and the, the topic or the uh, subtitle is Just As I Ain't. I'll have a new song for you, okay? This week, I want to answer the question, what's church? We've heard it our whole life. We've got the word on our sign out front. But what is it? Well, the word church is a word that appears throughout Scripture, but the initiation, the originator of this word church is indeed Jesus Christ. 
Now, there's a time in Scripture where Jesus had sent his disciples out on their own. He had, he had uh, trained them to be missionaries. He had sent them out into the mission field on their own, and they had come back, and they were all excited. And Jesus asked them two questions. First question was, who do men say that I am? That's a good question. Well, you know, you've been out there. You've been talking about me. Well, who does everybody think I am? Well, some think you're John the Baptist. Some think you're Elijah. Some think you're one of the prophets. Then he asked the question, where does the rubber, and this is where the rubber meets the road, who do you think I am? Now before I get into the answer and, and his response, isn't that something we have to ask all the time? Isn't that something we have to justify for ourselves on a constant basis? Who do we think Jesus is? And he asked these men specifically, who do you think I am? And Peter, who usually spent most of his time hopping around the New Testament with one foot in his mouth because he was, like us, just a big goober trying to get through life, he got it right. Oh, you're the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. You're the Messiah. And as we look in verse 17 and 18, Jesus makes a statement. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. Now, his name's Simon, but he renames him Peter, which means rock. I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my, see the word, church. And the gates of hell will not overcome it. So Jesus gives this grand scheme, this grand idea. He tells Peter, he says, because of your faith, it is this kind of faith, the power in this faith, that something amazing is going to happen. There's going to be this group called a church. Now, if you want to know what people mean by the things they say, watch what they do. Now, that's just a little advice from your Uncle Joe. You can take it or leave it. But if you want to know what people mean by what they say, watch what they do. Now, let's think for just a minute. Jesus is saying, on this rock I'll build my church, and then he goes about and he never builds anything, does he? Are there any structures on the face of this earth that Jesus ever built? And he was a carpenter. Any structures that he ever built that are still standing? No. No. So was he talking about a building? Obviously not, because he didn't go about doing that. Well, it all has to do with the word. Usually I don't like to roll out Greek words, because Greek words only mean a lot to you if you're Greek, right? But the word he uses here is ecclesia. Uh, it's not the first time that ecclesia has been used in, in Scripture, but he uses the word ecclesia. And what ecclesia translated strictly means is either congregation or gathering. It does not mean building. And actually, it is not even translated in a lot of English situations as church. It's translated as gathering. Now, what Jesus is saying here is this. If you watch what he does, you understand what he says. He says, upon this rock of faith, I'll build my following and hell can't do anything about it. Isn't that a cool idea? On this rock, I will build my following. But what he's teaching us, teaching point one, is Ecclesia, church, is not a specific place. It is a specific gathering. Now, I'm going to get you crossed out here for just a minute because I want to talk about a little bit of history. We all know that as Jesus lived, he lived, and he basically was creating this revolution, this following. These were people that were Jesus people. They had Jesus gatherings, and, and their intent was to turn the world upside down so that people could come into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. You follow me so far? However, because of the three years of his preaching and the things that he did, he angered the Roman Empire, he angered the Jews, and he was killed on a Roman cross. Now, the amazing part of Jesus being killed on a Roman cross is in less than 300 years, Constantine, who was the emperor of Rome, 
made Christianity the national religion of Rome. Is that not cool? That's kind of a cool story, right? Constantine, Rome, Christianity, all melded together. But here's the problem. As Constantine and Rome claimed Christianity as their own, and they started creating these versions of Scripture that were in Latin, they started translating this into Latin, and they translated the word ecclesia, and they used a German word called kirch. Where's we get church? Sounds a lot like church, right? Kirch. Kirch does not mean gathering. It does not mean following. Kirch means meeting place. It, it was a place for people to meet. And so in, in this German language, as they were trying to move this in and, and, and sort this all out, they came up with this word. Well, in 1522, William Tyndall decided that he was going to take the Latin translation of the Bible and he was going to translate it into English. And he did. Y'all probably know all this history, but I thought I'll throw it out here for free. It's worth every penny you're paying for it. And so he translates this Bible into English so that the common man in England could read it. Now, for his trouble, uh, they murdered him, which uh, I'm not sure that's good. Can you imagine? Oh, you're, you're going to translate the Bible? Well, let's kill you. Uh, th that's that's kind of what happened. But what ha also happened was when he translated Ecclesia, he translated it not as church, but as gathering. And why did this infuriate everyone? Because the idea of church, ecclesia, had become institutionalized. You see, for Rome, when Constantine created church as this national religion, what he also did was he took all the people in the Roman Empire who formerly were not a part of this, and money became a part of the church. Organization became part of the church. Government became part of the church. And they brought all these things in that were never intended to be part of the movement, and they made a meeting out of it. All right, I hope you're following me so far. And what's happening is, is that because of the Roman Empire and its influence into church, church had become marginalized. Church was not a revolution anymore. Church had ceased being a movement. Church had lost its mission. What church was, is church was a meeting. It was something you did. It was a place that you went. It was not a passion that burned within you. Now when Jesus is speaking to, to uh, Peter, he's speaking to 12 people who have gone out and they had talked about... Jesus to a group of people and the passion had inflamed everyone that they had spoken to and they came back and they were thrilled and they were excited and they spoke on faith you're the Messiah but that passion had been lost now back to today Britt Hume stands there and he says 20% of this country says they have a church affiliation Oh, what does that mean? Well, what does it mean to have an affiliation with church? Because if you truly understand church, you can't be affiliated with it. Either you is it or you ain't it. Right? Because that's what he's saying. He's saying church is not a place. It is a gathering. It's a following. Either you become it or you're not it. Now, when the Apostle Paul is talking to the church at Corinth, he's trying to help this, this struggling young church understand what ecclesia really is. And so in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, we look in verse, I think it's 9, and he says, We are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. Church. Uh, now, wait a minute. What, how are we a building? He's using a figurative term here. Jesus is saying, I'm going to create my gathering. It's a gathering of Jesus' people. And it's going to be something that never ends. 
It's something that can continue to be built one stone at a time, one person at a time. Go to verse 16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? Well, they all got the temple. They knew what that meant. That was where God lived. So what he's saying here is he's saying it's not a meeting place. It's not a thing you do on Sunday morning. Because you see, when I was growing up, church meant a lot of different things. Church to me meant the longest hour of the week. Okay? Uh, church to me meant an argument that I had with my parents about, do I really have to go? For other people, church means it's a benevolence point where we do things for the community or it's a place to network or it's a place a lot of other things. The problem is, is that's never what it was intended to be. It was intended to be organic. You're probably looking at the sign up here and you're thinking, oh, what in the world is that all about? It was intended to be organic. You see, the church is the body of Christ. And anything that is a body and a living organism either grows or it dies. And it continues to morph. It continues to change. It continues to churn. And that's church. We need to understand, first and foremost, that when Jesus is standing and he's looking at Peter, and he's specifically saying, because of your great faith, it's that kind of faith that is going to create my following. That he was not talking about a place we go. And he's not talking about a thing we do. And when you hear someone ask you, how do you do church? Please remind them, you can't do church. You is church. But teaching point number two is this. It's not just a gathering, but it's a gathering that has to have meaning. Ecclesia Church must have a laser-focused message and a global mission. It has to have a laser-focused message and a global mission. 1 Peter chapter 2, in, in verse 4 and 5. Once again, we're talking about building this building that's not a building at all. We're talking about creating this following. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, chosen by God, precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a royal priesthood or a holy priesthood. Now, I want you to look real carefully at that last word. Priesthood. You know what a priesthood is? Have you ever studied the, the name priest, what priest means? Priest means this. Bridge builder. That's why Jesus is called the high priest. He was the one who came to this earth, and we were far away from God, and he built this bridge between us and God. And he was able to create this bridge so that we could be at one with God again and saved. But then he tells us that we're living stones, we're part of this living organism, this church, we're all a part of this stuff, and then we become part of the priesthood. What does that mean? Now it's incumbent upon us that we have a message and a mission. Our message is the story of Jesus. Our mission is to go out to the people in the black boxes and build a bridge that helps them get from where they are to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, let's go to the next verse I've got up there, and it's, it's 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, or 6 and 7. It says, For in Scripture it says, See, I lay in Zion a chosen and precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. I've got over here a building. Well, it's not really a building. It's the corner of the building. And I don't know how familiar you are with cornerstones and, and how buildings used to be built. Building's not built that way anymore. There's not a cornerstone in this building anywhere, I don't think. If you find it, let me know. I'd love to see it. But I don't think it's here. But when they built buildings in the day of Jesus, they would always build a building, and they would begin with a cornerstone. And what this cornerstone did was this. This cornerstone was a perfect stone. It, everything was at a perfect 90-degree angle. It was a perfect height. And the rest of the building was built in relationship to that one stone. If that stone was off, the building wasn't square. 
If that stone was not parallel, top and bottom, the building would fall. And he says, okay, this organism that we're building, this building that will never end, the cornerstone of that is Jesus. And they're saying, well, why am I bringing all that up? Take this over here. The church must be measured by how much we're like Jesus. Not how we meet together, what songs we sing, how the pre... By the way, if you haven't noticed, uh, bald people for the last two weeks have done all the lessons. Okay? So it's not about bald people. It's not, it's not about all these things. The church is measured by Jesus. Let me throw another one in there for you. I know I probably shouldn't be talking to people on Facebook, but... Uh, I, I am on Facebook, and uh, one of my Facebook friends is a student of mine when I taught high school Bible. He is now a preacher at a church in Nashville, and he came on to the um, Facebook, and he, he's always asking questions for anybody to answer. This time was, what does your preacher wear and why? I'm glad y'all weren't on there. An interesting thing was this. The answers continued to be based around this thought. He wears whatever the elders tell him to because he is under the authority of the elders and they, okay. Now, we got six elders, they're good guys. But I'm not ready to take fashion tips from them. Now a couple of them are kind of GQ, one borders on metrosexual. <laughs> but I'm not ready to do it. But here's why. It's not because they don't dress nice. It's not because they're not much better looking than me. It has nothing to do with us. Here's what it has to do with. These guys were called by God to keep people, to help us be in line with Jesus. Not to worry about what we dress with and, and all the peripherals. It's about Jesus. Okay? That we're to measure everything by Jesus. And, and what happens is, is in the church, unlike this wall I've built that has all the stones the same size, there's a lot of different size stones and a lot of different shaped stones. And what happens is we build them, we put them together, but we line them all up. With Jesus. He is the cornerstone. And everything we do, church, everything we do as a church has to be measured by does it reflect Jesus Christ? Okay? So when we get in our petty little, uh, petty little arguments about this thing or that thing, are you reflecting Jesus Christ? Let me ask these questions. When you think of church, as it reflects Jesus Christ, is the church a movement and a revolution, or is it a meeting? Yeah, we're supposed to gather together. Hebrews 10, 24. Do not forsake the assembling yourselves together, as a matter of some is, but encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Are we to gather together? Man, what we're doing here this morning is important because the Holy Spirit's here and some amazing things are happening. But are we a movement? Or are we just an errand you run on Sunday morning? Because if we're just an errand you run on Sunday morning, you're probably affiliated. If we're a movement, you're a church. Is the church, this gathering, we'll be responsible for us. Is this gathering, do we have a mission? Or do we just have a ministry model? Because Jesus, this ecclesia that he talks about in Matthew chapter 16, is about a movement. It's about a, revelation, a revolution. It's about a mission. Do we act with our actions and our resources and everything in our life that we truly believe that Jesus is the only hope for man in this world? Or do we grease squeaky wheels? Because the church is a movement. It's a growing organism. It's a mission. It's a revolution. And it is man's greatest hope in this world. 
And the church has to be all about Jesus. Don't believe me? Yeah, I'm going to do this. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch traveling down the road. The Ethiopian eunuch is reading some prophecy from the book of Isaiah about this man. He asked the question, he says, uh, who is this man that the scripture speaks of? And Philip preached to him, church organization. No. Uh, Philip preached to him, policy of benevolence. No. Philip preached to him Jesus and him crucified. And his response it changed his life forever. When someone comes forward and they want to be baptized, we stand them in front of everybody and we ask them to confess something. Do they confess that they believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God? Do they believe that this is the church, the one and only true church, and that no other church is going to heaven? No. We ask them, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? You believe that story? Because if you can believe that story, that's what everything points to. So when we start talking about church, you can either be affiliated with church or you can be church. E either we're a gathering of Jesus' people or we're something far less. And we have marginalized the statement of ecclesia. I want to leave you with this point. We're going to pray and offer an invitation, and that's this. You know, when we look at church, we need to understand that church is not about getting mankind into heaven. That's what the cross is about. You see, church is about getting heaven into mankind. That's what we're to be about doing. So if you want to know if we're the church, if you want to know you're the church, if that's your mission, your church. If it's not your mission, you have no hope of ever reaching these four boxes. They'll never know Jesus because you're not following him. Uh, church is not about getting mankind into heaven. It is about getting heaven into mankind. That's what we're here to do. We do one thing. We take people that don't know Jesus and we bring them into a life-changing relationship with him. I hope you'll partner with us as we do that in 2013. Let's bow together and pray. God, you're an awesome God. We are thankful for this morning. I thank you for the message uh, that comes straight from your mouth. It's, it's about who we're supposed to be and that it's, it's not about a place. It's not about an organization. It's not, it, it is about gathering and following Jesus. My prayer is that's who we become. And if we've done things in the past that have kept us from doing that, we are sorry. And I personally repent of the times that I've done things that did not reflect him. Lord, lift us up and allow us to be your hands and your feet in this world and allow us to be people who truly will change the world so heaven can come down and fill all our souls. And it's in the name of your son we pray. And amen. There may be one or more of you that love the Lord. You've not taken up your cross to follow him. We invite you to do that. We believe that baptism is the way you begin your journey with Jesus. It's the way you become in line with him, the chief cornerstone. Also, if you'd like the prayers of the church and like to come home or repent, whatever you'd like to do, whatever it is that's standing your way, we want one thing. We want to be in heaven with you. That's it. We hope that we can serve you. Also, our elders will be room in A56 across the hall. Uh, if you'd like to be shepherded individually, you'd like to speak to them individually, they'll be there to, to minister to your needs. We love you. We want to be in heaven with you. Whatever we can do to encourage you or help you, we want to do that. While we stand, while we sing, for your encouragement. My heart will sing no other name. Jesus, Jesus, my heart will sing. Jesus, Jesus, I'm running.
into your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reign. Light of the world.